Welcome to our training video. We're doing this video to try and show the guys exactly how to install a solid or engineered or laminate wooden floor to specification so you have no failures or comebacks after the job. The most important thing about installing wooden floor really is your pre-installation. We have requirements of pre-installations and we can go through this list one by one and step by step with you to show you actually, physically, in a situation in a home, exactly how to install and to do your pre-installation requirements. Right, I'd just like to run through some of the exterior conditions you've got to look for when you arrive on the site. And number one is gutters and downpipes are properly placed to drain water away from the structure. So we can have a look at the gutters and downpipes. We have no gutters here and we have no downpipes. So the next thing is the patios and balconies are sloping away. We're going to look at that as well. Uh, guys, we're on a balcony here outside the upstairs bedroom where the wooden floor is going to go. I'll just show you here by the door. You can see the tile is actually laid on a slope, if you can just see how it's sloping down this way, which is already a good thing. And you'll notice in the corner of the, you've got two exits here for the water, and this whole patio and balcony is sloping down towards these exits. Well done to the builders, they've taken this into consideration, they've put their holes, they've sloped everything down, we're happy with this balcony. The flower beds are lower than the screens, the pop-up sprinklers are facing the garden, not the house, and here's a sprinkler in the corner here. Uh, unfortunately, we can't switch this one on, but it looks like this is possibly going to be hitting the wall. This sprinkler is on for an hour to a day. That water is being drawn into the wall and will come through your wall onto the other side and could affect your floors. So be careful of that. Mention to the owners and watch it, because that could become a failure, simply from a little sprinkler. Exterior doors with no overhang. Here we have a sliding door with no overhang. So this means when the door is closed, the rain will be directly on the door. But we're having a look at the structure, the, the construction of the door, and we see that there is a sill here that is lower. So at least it's a lower step than being flush with the door. So we should be okay, but we might just bring that to the owner's attention as well. Right, so here we are on the side of the house. We notice that there's a tap here, and there's no drain for the water to run away. This could be a danger point, and this may be advisable for you to note in your, on your quote that this could be a possible danger point for the owners to look at. This would be a better scenario for the outside tap on the other side. At least the water is being drained away. Much better. Well, we've been around the whole house now. We've seen all the situations on the whole house. Uh, we're going to note all these problems so the owner knows. Now we're going to go inside and look at the inside situation to see if we can spot any possible problems there. So let's go inside the house and have a look there. Here we are on the, in the room downstairs where there's a wooden floor going to be. So this is going to be a laminate floor. We were, minutes ago we were on the outside where we saw the uh, door here with no overhang and with a sill that has got a slight uh, a drop down. So it's safer than if it was flush, but it's still, as I say, you can see the scenario on the inside. The rain drives against this window possibly may come through. So your plastic here, of course, is extremely important. And of course, just mention it to the owner, it could possibly happen. Then it may absolve you from having a problem later. Right, okay, let's go up the stairs because uh, there's some wooden floors upstairs as well. But don't think because it's upstairs, there's no chance of a problem. You have other problems upstairs. So let's have a look what could possibly happen. Over here, there's a bathroom. Let's just have a quick look into the bathroom here. No shower, but there's a bath in the corner, then, and every bath, of course, has got a trap by that wall. So if there's a leaking trap, it could possibly give you moisture on the other side of the wall. So let's go into the room where we're going to fit. Okay, so here we're in the room where we're going to fit. 
Right, the wall that uh, is on the other side of the bathroom is there, so it's important we check that wall. This is a new house, so I doubt there's any leaks yet. But you, know, you could have an old house that's been going for 30 years, even then the wall could be wet from a leak. The wet trades are all finished, the painting's done, that's important. There's, the windows are all in the house, so that's important. So I'd say we're ready to actually start doing our moisture tests, checking the flatness of our screens, and we can start with our installations. So we're happy. So let's start with the moisture tests. This moisture test is vital because if it's wet, it can rise and go into your timber underneath, even though there's plastic. So let's have a look at what meters we've got here. As far as sulfur goes, we don't sanction any particular meter. However, we use these two meters. This is a Proti meter, that's the brand. That's what we call a Tramex close encounter. Concrete, sorry, concrete encounter, a Tramex concrete encounter. And uh, either one of these is okay, just for an idea of the reading. You know, we're not moisture experts. We are flooring installers. We just want to know, is there or isn't there moisture? So, what happens if there's moisture? The question needs to be asked. Is this rising damp in our old house? Or is this a new slab or a new screen that's still drying out? So this being a new house, and in fact we're upstairs now, so whatever we read here, if it's wet, we know that it's still drying out. So, these are guidelines. Guys, there's many other meters on the market that you can use, but these are just guidelines. And what you need to do is know your meter, understand your meter. Go to your manufacturer and know what moisture levels are dry. That's vital, because if you think it's dry, it might be sopping wet if you don't understand your meter. Right, so let's have a look over here on this proti meter. We're gonna, this is just checking the surface. Let's put it in. And there we're reading, looks like just over, say, 16%. A little bit high. Let's just try that now with the Tramex, with the concrete moisture meter. Okay, so there we got it. It's, uh, it's under three and a half. So it's 3.3. Ultimately, we're looking for three on this meter, and ultimately here we're looking for about uh, 12. So let's just see, because uh, we read here, let's just have another look at this reading. Yeah, about 16%. So sort of on the border, you'll notice on the meter, it's, there's a green, then it moves to orange, and then it moves up to red. We want it basically in the green. If you, once it's in the green, we, looking for, we, we put a 250 or 200 micron virgin plastic down on top, which is basically a dead block. So if it's in the green, we're happy. If it's 3%, we're happy. So we're sort of just on the border here. Uh, it may need another few days with good ventilation to dry out. Uh, what we could do, we're going to do the exercise now. We're actually going to draw into the screen to see what it's like a little bit deeper. So let me get the drilling machine and then we can drill some holes and see what it's like a bit deeper and it will give us a better idea lower down. So let me go and get my drill. Right guys, so we're in another room now. We're going to check the moisture in this other room as well. We didn't have power in the other room, but of course you can take an extension. Here we've got an extension here. So we'll check the moisture here in the screen as well. Let's have a look what we are here. Right, on this meter we're showing 13, 14. It's in the green, so it's, look, it's looking good. We're going to look at it also on the Tramex. The Tramex is the real concrete uh, meter. And as you can see, it's reading 3, which is perfect for inland. On coastal, up to 3.5. So, let's make a note. This is a pencil, but best to use a marker. Let's make a note, moisture. Uh, Tramex, that's the type of meter you used. Uh, 2%. And today's date is the 19th of May, 2012. If there's ever a problem, you'll be able to prove that you took the moisture because you got it here. And not only, uh, take, your, take a camera and actually photograph yourself and your reading and take photographs so you've got some proof. Also note it on your quote that you tested the moisture because if if something happens that's not beyond your control, you have not got a moisture reading, it could bite you back. Because everything goes back to the installer. Everything is the installer's fault. They try to blame the wood, they try to blame everything. But you the man, the installer is the key man who takes responsibility for all these things. 
That's why we have to do all these tests, pre-installation and installation requirements. Right, now we're going to drill a quick hole here, and we're going to just test a little bit deeper into the screen. So, now we're down, what, about 20 mils, and a second hole. Right, because this meter, you know, it gives you a different reading because it's actually reading uh, more like if it was reading wood, which is to the air moisture. We like to look a little bit deeper and we're still reading in the green a bit deeper. So I would say this room, we're happy. We can now start checking the levels and continue with the installation. So let's, let's do that. Guys, very important tool, straight edge. Without the straight edge, you can never know that the screed or slab is flat. You can't judge it by just looking at it. So let's use the straight edge now and see if the screed is okay. So let's go down. Now, let's have a look what we're seeing over here. Okay, right, so after holding the straight edge down, you can actually see that it lifts quite a lot on the one side. You know, you've got a bit of a rocking effect. This could be because of a high spot, which you may have to knock down if there's a high spot here. Or it could be that you need to uh, screen this whole floor with a self-leveler. Just also with a straight edge, of course, you can't just check one place. You need to check various. So a good method of doing that is actually holding it down on the one side and moving it around in a circle. And as you're going, you can start seeing your hollow spots. And that's where you can start marking your hollow spots to patch those areas. So, please guys, check it all over the whole floor that everything is flat, but we have got an allowance of three millimeter, so there is some allowance, we can never get 100% flat, and it's too expensive to put a full self-leveling street every single time. So a bit of patchwork may be necessary, which is of course what you're going to do, because if you don't do the patchwork and the floor is bouncy, it may come back to you with your customer, then you've got to start taking floors out and all sorts of nonsense. It's too expensive and you're going to lose money. Guys, check the flatness of your screens. Now we're going to show you the two situations, a patching of a screen and a full screen. So it's self-leveler, let's do that. This room we're going to do a full screen here. It's a self-leveler, it's only five millimeter thick when it dries. But it'll give you a level floor. So we're just going to tape the walls up so we don't get any of the slurry onto the actual walls itself. Um, we're also going to first prime the floor because the primer is like a bonding liquid. It actually bonds the screed, lev leveling screed to the, new, the old screed, the, the existing screed. So what happens is if you have a glue down installation and the floor moves, you know that it's not going to pull the self-leveler away from the original screed. When we do a glue down installation later on, we're going to show you how to do the test to test the strength of the screeds if they're strong enough for a glue down with a movement of wood. But now we're going to do the priming here, so let's start with the priming. Don't take shortcuts, because a lot of sh people shortcuts, just put a screed on without a primer, you're going to have to find your screed delaminating. So do it according to the manufacturer's instructions, it's very important. Well, as the installer says, uh, you'll be able to use the underlay again, but to, the cost of repainting a wall will be a lot more expensive than a little bit of underlay, which is not too expensive. Okay, guys, before your primer, make sure the floor is clean and stripped, otherwise your primer is not going to stick to it. So, make sure that your floor is clean, and once it's all stripped up, then we can start putting in the, um, on the primer. Right. Got to be fully re-screeded. Uh, two reasons was it, two reasons was a little bit low. You need to bring it up a little bit, and of course the main reason that it really wasn't flat. So we needed to give it a full self-leveler, not just patchwork in this case because it was running off. So once we finish mixing, we'll pour it in, 
plant it, the, uh, the self level according to the, the, the instructions and uh, then we can have a smooth surface and we should start laying our floors on. We've got two bags of self leveler which needs 4.4 litres of water each. So let's put the water in. That's one. Right, now we can put in the self leveler speed and we can start mixing. I've got a drilling machine here with a nice, a nice paddle. That'll give us a mix, and you want to mix for about five minutes. You get to make sure the whole emulsion is mixed in. Hard to see here, it's a bit of dust. Just going to open another bag. This is a room that's got to be fully re-speeded. Two reasons, it was a little bit low. You need to bring it up a little bit, and of course the main reason that it really wasn't flat, so we needed to give it a full self-leveler, not just patchwork in this case, because it was running off. So once we finish mixing, we'll pour it in, apply the, the, uh, the self-leveler according to the, the, the instructions, and uh, then we can have a smooth surface and we should start laying our floors on. So let me give this the last mix, and then we'll start pouring. Okay, I'm putting on my spike shoes because I'm going to be standing in the slurry and of course I don't want to get my beautiful Converse All-Stars dirty. So we will put on these spiked shoes so we're not standing in the actual slurry. Right. Now we're going to throw the self-leveler. It gets applied with a rake. Let's chuck it out. You see it's all nicely mixed. We have no lumps and bubbles in it. There we go. And you can see it's already how it's flowing. And that's what we want. Right, get rid of that bucket. Now we can rake it out. Uh, I'll just tell you guys, you know, self leveling screens, if you get by the, the genuine self level, that's exactly what it is. Now, when it comes to patchwork, it's not really a self level, it's just more of a patching screen. But on the self level screen, you've got to mix according to the manufacturer's instructions. Exactly what the manufacturer says, that's what you need to do. Don't take shortcuts because it'll bite you in the back later. Okay, so every manufacturer has his own instructions. Go to the book. We're in another room now, and here we're going to do a small bit of patchwork. We don't need to do a full screed like we're doing in that room. This room's just got one little area by the door which is dipping down, so we need to level that. So if you just come down, two things I want to show you. you know, during the building process, there's little spots of cement that people have dropped. You really, guys, you must clean your screens properly. Gift, where's that broom? Just come and sweep here. Oh, he's got, okay, all these little, little lumps must come, must come out. So we'll give those a sweep, but that's what you've got to do. And I'll just show you back on the straight edge. You'll notice underneath, you've got this little dip here. Now if you don't level that, this floor is going to dip, always be dipping by the door and you're going to have a complaint from the owner and to rectify it off is a major problem. The rest of the screed here is fine. So guys, check all your screeds, that little dip can cause a problem after the job with your customer and your payment. So let's do that now. I like what I see here is the plastic against the door. So obviously there's plastic underneath here and they've made provision to stop any uh, water coming in with this plastic. Okay, you're going to just check now the straight edge with all our different areas that you're going to do. So gift is just, just marking. So he's always he's looking at the straight edge and marking at the same time. And this little area is the, is the area we're going to patch. As we said, it's quite expensive to do a full screed. So here we're just doing a patchwork which is suitable. Right, so now we, we, it's all marked, now we're going to prime it. Yes. 
by the door here yeah, was a little bit of a dip. We checked that with our straight edge, as you can see it here. Now we're just going to we put our, our uh, bonding liquid on the floor, and now we the primer's there. Now we're going to just quickly self-level this little patch, this little area only. And then we can also start laying in this room in the morning. So there we go, just this little area to get it all straight. Right, there we have it. Just to rake it out. Right, now you're putting the roller over it just to aerate it and get rid of all the air bubbles. And this gives you a beautiful smooth finish like you saw just now in the other room. Right, this will be dry by the morning and we can check the moistures and we can lay in this room as well. Aerate it and then be okay with this area and we can lay. Guys, these are very important things to do. You can see all the work has gone into this site doing things right before we start laying the floor. It's vital because afterwards it's too late. Then you've got days and days of pulling out floors, starting again. Do it right the first time, it'll pay off. Gift's going to finish off what I started. Our gift, it's going well. I think we'll have enough for this whole room. Then we'll leave it to dry overnight. It's, it's all cured properly. Test the moistures one more time that there's no more moisture left in this because these self-leveling screens normally with, within a day or so they completely dry because it's, it's only a few more thick. And then we can start laying in the morning. So, gift, let's go. We're nearly finished. Right, uh, we finished putting the self-level on. I'm not, not going to stand on it now. I'm outside the door. But we'll show you how it looks. You can see it's like a mirror, like glass. Tomorrow morning this will be dry perfectly flat. So there you guys, you can see the self-leveler. If you look there towards the window, you'll see how the window is actually reflecting in it. It looks like glass. Quick, quick and easy. As you can hear by the noise, we're on a site here, so this is what you're getting as the real deal. Actual action as it would be on one of your sites. Just to talk a little bit about acclimatization of timber on site. Um, you don't always have to acclimatize, only sometimes. One of the big reasons when you're acclimatizing for solid timber is that it may have been dried in the Cape or in the, or in the coastal area and they normally acclimatize or kill and dry the timber down to about 12 to 14 percent. It's a little bit high for Joburg so you may need to pin stack or sticker stack the wood which I'm going to drop in a picture so you can see that and uh, to do that until such time comes when your timber is dried to the air around it. And there is a way of checking the air and I'm going to show you that also just now. When you come to acclimatizing timber, you got to know what to acclimatize it to. Generally timber, if you're importing wooden flooring, generally it's all dry to 8%. They've calculated that to be an average air moisture content, 8%. So with flooring, we like it quite dry, so normally it's hard to get everything exactly 8%. So they say plus minus 2, so it might be 6 to 8 or 8 to 10, and that's acceptable. On the coastal areas, it's more like 12 to 14%, and that's a little bit half for the inland. So if you're taking timber that's dried in the on the coast, and you're coming into Johannesburg or the inland areas, then you need to stick a stack it and dry to inland, down to about 8%. If it's coming from Joburg or from an inland area, up to the coastal areas, Durban, Cape Town for example, Durban's a very humid area, you need to stick a stack and acclimatize that inland dried um, timber to 12 to 14 percent to the average moisture, air moisture in the area. So all those sort of things you can find on the Sulfur website. Here's what we call a hygrometer. This hygrometer, I can tell you now that the uh, humidity at the moment is 30 percent. We're in winter at the moment, so the 30 percent is the uh, bottom low, in other words, we need a humidity between 30 and 50 percent. Yeah, it goes to 29, so it's quite low, the humidity at the moment, and it can get lower. The temperature today, if you look on the hygrometer, is 21.5, and on the Sulfur website, and we'll show you a graph, it's 29 percent humidity versus a 21 percent uh, temperature will give you a, an air moisture, and you can see what you need to acclimatize to. When you're acclimatizing for laminate flooring, 
um, general acclimatization, engineered flooring is often not necessary to acclimatize. However, we like the boxes to be put on site in the room. They're going to be installed, which is more temperature acclimatizing for a few days. So in order, it may come out of your store, which might be very cold, and you might be moving into a house which is nice and warm inside. We just need the acclimatization in temperature to get, because timber also expands and contracts with temperature too. So mostly it's temperature acclimatization. With solid wood, if it's coastal and inland, you need to do some different acclimatization. So a hygrometer, quite a handy little tool to have to understand what is your air moisture against the moisture content of your timber. Right, uh, still on the subject of acclimatization, it's quite important to know that with a dry air, timber shrinks. Now, often you find in hotels, gyms, restaurants, where you have air conditioners. Now, what an air conditioner does, it actually takes the moisture out of the air. So, if you're going to acclimatize your timber to a room where there's air conditioning, you need to make sure the air conditioners are running while the timber is acclimatizing, because that's going to take it even lower in moisture. So be careful of air conditioners. If you just bring ordinary timber that has not been acclimatized and you put it in a room that's air conditioned, you're going to get shrinkage and that's gaps between the boards and that might become a complaint. But uh, air conditioners, please guys, they take moisture out of the air, acclimatize with them on. Okay, so now we're about to start laying. First thing we're going to do, then sweep the floor, get all the debris, all the dust, clean it out, and we'll also give it a vacuum. Then we know the floor is spotless and clean, and we can start laying. So let's just sweep this room out, vacuum, and we go. As you can see, there's some patchwork that's been done here. This is because the levels weren't right, so we did some self-leveling in patches. Now we're busy uh, laying the underlays, all the prep work, pre-installation requirements, all done. Now you can feel safe. Start laying the floor. First thing, this is a, a combination of plastic and underlay. So it's combined. The plastic is there, the underlay is there. You can have them separate as well. The plastic is a 200 micron plastic or a 250 micron. Must be virgin and not uh, recycled, else it could just start disintegrating. Right, so here we go. Underlay going in, and then we all start laying the floor. Okay. So, uh, as we said, it's a vir virgin plastic. How do we know it's a virgin plastic? Well, you've got to buy from re reputable suppliers and specify that you want to buy a virgin plastic. You know, it's hard for you to do the test, but if you're buying an SABS green, that's virgin. Um, your supplier you're buying from, you should ask and, and be told by him that it's a virgin. And he's the guy responsible then for that. So make sure that you order virgin plastic and not... Don't try and save a few cents on a bit of recycle. It's really, you, you're, not save, you're not doing anybody any favors. Right, you can see over here that there is an overlap. And then, this, this must go next to it, not on it, isn't it? Yeah, next to it, there's an overlap of plastics to stop any moisture, because moisture rises. And when you, have a, when you have an overlap, moisture does not go sideways, it rises. So just to have your flap over, so it'll stop rising moisture. Even though it's dry, the reason for still having plastic, there might be a little bit of residual moisture in the screen. And of course, once you block off the top, it's going, if it rises, it's not going to get to your floor. The other reason is we've got balconies here. If any moisture goes under the door, under the slab from the rain, the plastic is there to stop it. Plastic is number one. No installation without plastic. So products coming in. Uh, this is a click system installation, like we said. It's a laminate one, not an engineered. The same rules apply to laminate and engineered. What we're saying is when it's click, right? So with this installation, the longest you can go on an installation is 10 meters. That's the longest. And the widest you can go is 8 meters. So 10 by 8. Anything over 10 needs an exp uh, expansion joint on the length. And anything over 8 on the width needs an expansion joint. This room is less than 8 by 10. So this room, we need no expansion joints, barring the ones 
on the wall. So we can lay in this room no problem whatsoever. Technically, we're 100% here. So, right, let's go. We hope to finish this room quickly. It's only a small room, it's a wide plank. Click system, how much easier can you get? Right, so you'll notice what's happening here. The gift is cutting here, this piece short, because that's, you can't have this joint, you need more of a staggered joint to give it the strength. If you have two joints here, of course, that'll weaken the floor and, of course, look, look strange. So, he's starting off with a cut, and thereafter, his off cuts will, you will play with these starters to give him the stagger and to create the strength of the floor. Right, voila. On a laminate floor, your expansion for a room like this is eight millimeter. So what uh, Jeff's doing here now is just cutting some blocks so, for the expansion. So we'll pack that in the back so you create the expansion against the wall. Right, second row going in. You can see now it's being cut and it's got a stagger, stagger in it. It's about 200 millimeters away from the last joint and that will automatically create the same all along the line because these boards are all one length. As you can see here, there's the joint in the previous row, next row the joint's over here, and that'll be this constant throughout. <laughs> Guys, when it comes to the click flooring, Please, manufacturer's instructions rule. How to click it in, some people want it to be tapped. Please go through manufacturer's instructions, some might be a little bit different to others. Uh, this whole screed area that we done yesterday, you saw us pouring it. It's now, uh, when well, it looks dry, we're going to test it to see if it's suitable to lay on. Uh, this sort of self-leveling screed can normally, should normally take about two days to dry, so it's only the next day, but let's test it and see how we're doing. So, glasses on so we can see, and let's have a look. We're testing this time with a protimeter, and as you can see, it's six, on 60%, we're looking for 12%, so it's still sopping wet. So we need to let it wait another day. We're going to leave the windows open so we can get air circulating, and we'll test it again tomorrow, and then it's all fine, we'll lay. But you can just see the quality of this type of self-leveling screen, how beautiful it comes out, and level. So I'm going to actually, in a minute, get a straight edge, and I'm going to show you how flat it is compared to what it was originally. So let me just get that straight edge quickly. Gift, thanks. We've got the straight edge. Let's have a look how we're looking here. So we'll put the straight edge down here. Let's have a look. Well, I can tell you what. That's perfect. That's 100% perfect. Let's get the camera down here and have a look. You'll see there's not a gap. That's perfection. That's what we're looking for. So, not a big job, but a job well worthwhile. And now we know we're definitely not going to get a complaint from the customer because of the spongy floor. Great stuff. So tomorrow morning it should be dry and we can start laying. So let's take you and show you the other room that we laid yesterday. And now we're going to go put on mouldings and we'll show you that uh, skirtings, mouldings and that sort of thing. So let's go to our other room that we did. This is the room that we did yesterday. All we're going to do now, you can see the floor, beautifully laid. Nice and solid. No sponginess because of uh, in, uh, screws that are not level because we've leveled all that. We're going to put in a moulding over here which it's already been placed, so we're going to just show you this molding over here, that this is going to fit there and how it's fitted. We're also going to put a molding on this side to cover this expansion. You can see the skirtings that are on here now, they're still going to be attached. Guys, skirtings. We'll show you a little bit later on how to do the skirting properly. However, just to show you how it's here, very important, your mitres. If you do bad mitres, your customer's going to reject the job. So have a look at the mitres here and you'll see that these mitres are very good and that's the way to do it. If it's not right, redo it there and then because you're only going to come back again. So have a look down here at the mitres and you can see how nice and perfect 
this might easy. And that's the sort of job you guys want to do for your customers. And that's good. We'll cover this expansion joint here. And then over here, they pass gift one more by the door. Down here by the tile area in the entrance of the door, we're going to put one molding there. And then uh, this room is finished. And we can move on to the next rooms. Cool. What Gifty is doing here now is, is actually putting in the holes into the street for the track. Now what happens with this kind of laminate molding is you have a track that gets screwed down to the floor and uh, the actual molding, which has got a male bit, just clips in here to the track and that's how it works. So we're just busy drilling the holes, put the track in and then we can clip the moldings into the track. So let's carry on with Gift and finish drilling the holes so we can install this track. Uh, tracks are going in, as you can see, they drill the holes, the track is in. Now we're going to just screw everything into the floor plug and then we can just clip the uh, moulding in and that's, the, and that's it. So let's finish drilling the screws in and then we can do the clipping. Okay, now the screw, screws are in. Now we can put in the actual end cap itself. This end, this end cap has two purposes. Number one, to close this expansion joint. And number two, to actually hold the floor down here because there's no skirting. So this holds the floor down. So the way it's done here is the floor is loose underneath this end cap, even though it's holding it down, and the movement can still happen without... If you had to put glue here, of course you're restricted. So put the strips in the way it's designed to go in. Okay, here we have the strip going in. Yeah, the, let's see how it fits. If we're all happy. Holding the floor down, beautiful finish, matching moldings, no complaints from the customer, and very important, technically correct. So you can see Gifty's got his foot going there, and you can see there's no movement. The end cap is doing his job. Cover the expansion, holding the floor down. No glue on the floor. Perfect guys, well, well done. These are the fitters. These guys did it right. They've been to the South African Wood Flooring Association training. They've been to accreditation. And that's why they do such a job. Well done, gift. Well done, my boot. Thanks. Right, guys, as you can see, this is a cupboard. We don't have skirting around a cupboard, but we still need the expansions. So how do we cover that? Well, the best way is with a quarter round, a quadrant, or a scotia. Scotia is a quarter round inverted the other way. In this case, we've got a scotia. And the nice thing, guys, all these moldings match the floor. So let's show you the expansion joint down here and the scotia that we're going to put. So here is the expansion joint, as you can see. No skirting, so we're going to cover this. This is a scotia. You can see it's inverted quarter round. And that's going to sit there beautifully, and that will give us a nice finish and cover the expansion joint as well as hold the floor down. This coach will be fitted, will be nailed into the cupboard, not into the floor. Guys, finishes are very important. You can see over here, they've actually undercut the door frame, so the floor goes under the door frame. There are some installers, even though it is technically correct to actually cut an expansion joint around the frame, it doesn't look nice, and often the customers complain about that. So undercutting door frames, guys, is important. There is a special tool for doing it. All it is is a saw that oscillates, it does this. 
So it's very easy while you're holding this, you're actually undercutting the door frame straight on the line. And then that, this tool will just cut the door frame out dead straight. Easy to get to. So guys, the right tools for the right job. A lot of old houses out there, and they all got old crawl spaces. Now we know that if you put a new floor, kill and dry timber over a crawl space, it's going to fail within the first couple of days or weeks. So there's a very specific method of installing a wooden floor over a crawl space. And today we're going to show you that method of exactly how it's done. So if you ever have the situation of a crawl space, this is the only way to do it. So let's show you the floor and show you the different places why we're we going to change the floor. Mainly because of termite and age. So let's show you those different places. Okay, one of the reasons for changing this floor, in fact it looks like the main reason, is that this has been eaten by termite. So the whole floor is collapsing here. The beams have been eaten and the floor has been eaten. So. It served its purpose. This floor is uh, 1920s, so you're talking already 80, 90 years old. That's how long this floor has lost, it's done its life. Now's the time to put in a new floor that'll last another 90 or 100 years. So let's start pulling this floor out and going through the process of our crawl space installation. <laughs> We're in the crawl space now, and uh, I'd like to go through a few points to explain to you why a new wooden floor cannot go into this crawl space like they did in the old days. In the old days, the timber was air dried, and you'll notice that they also put nails through the surface of the flooring to also keep it down. And because the timber was air dried, it's, it's sort of acclimatized to the crawl space uh, uh, humidity. They also had air bricks to try and keep the humidity down as best as possible. So if you look at the moisture now, in this, just in the moist in the joist is on 25%. And if you look at the moisture down here in the, uh, on the floor, it's sopping wet, it's on 90. Soil on the base, it's getting wet all the time. And what happens, it causes underneath a situation, uh, a, a humid area. So it's wet, it's humid, and the termites love that. And it's not the termite that's going to get it, it's going to be the dry rot that's going to ruin this floor. So the new way of doing it now, what we're going to do, we're going to replace all the joists, because they're all rotten and termite eaten. Put new treated joists, because treated joists and termites won't eat and it won't rot. So that'll last another 80 to 100 years. And then we're going to close off this whole soil space with plastic. And then extra sheet of plastic over the new joists, and then a flat sheet of plastic, that's three sheets of plastic. That should stop because moisture rises, it tries to get in everywhere, so we're trying to stop it as much as possible. Then we're using a commercial ply as a subfloor, and then we can carry on laying our floor. So as you can see, the beams are wet, the beams are rotten, now we're going to change, get the rest of the floor out and replace all these beams and get on with the plastic and the waterproofing. <laughs> The floor's all out now. We just left behind with the, the beams. All these beams are going to have to be replaced. Looks like it's, everything's uh, eaten or rotten, but mostly termite eaten. You can actually see the tunnels the termites have made. This is a piece that I've actually fallen through now when I was walking along these beams. So be careful in this situation. Right, so uh, it'll be off to the hardware to get new treated joists. You need treated so they don't rot because you see there have been some repair work done here with pine untreated. Within five years they were gone already. Treated beams, SABS 250 micron plastic and uh, rebuild the walls a little bit where they've collapsed and we get this floor uh, going for the next hundred years. Right, so let's go to the hardware and get all the beams. <laughs>
see all the bees are out now and the termite boys are here. Now they're going to start spraying all the insecticides to make sure that they kill all the termites and I think they give something like a five-year guarantee. Now's the time to clean up the whole crawl space, get rid of all the rubble, get it nice and neat. You can build up the little retaining walls again, or the plinths, plinths that are going to hold the bearers, and then we can start putting in our plastic. Remember the plastic, the 250 micron SABS plastic, and this will stop the moisture from coming up. So you're trying to block off as much moisture as possible. Moisture always rises, so it's important that we put three layers, as you're going to see just now. But this is the first layer we're putting in at the moment on the grounds. Right, so Henry the installer is now cutting some wooden little blocks, and he's going to use these blocks to actually shoot against the plastic onto the wall to hold the plastic in place once the floor is closed up so it doesn't move. Right, so Henry's cutting the blocks, now we're going to go inside, get the plastic going properly, and then you're going to see us shooting the blocks into the wall. Here we go, here come the blocks. And he's going to get his pneumatic concrete nailer and simply just nail them into the wall. There we go. So he'll do this all around to keep the plastic in place and then we can start putting in the beams. Right, what's happening now is Henry's nailing a 114 by 38 piece of pine tree for timber onto a retaining wall. The reason for this is that when you place the joist, you've actually got something to nail into. You'll notice in this crawl space, it's a little bit different. The retaining wall actually acts as a bearer. In other crawl spaces, you have just square round brick plinths and the bearer sits on top of the plinth and then the joist sits on top of the bearer. In this case, the retaining wall is the bearer. That's the way. Right, so Henry's done all the 104 by 38s on top of the retaining walls and now he can start nailing the joists or the beams into that piece of pine that he's placed. He's checking the levels. Let's have a look. Perfect level. There's a master craftsman at work. Now going in, and we can continue this procedure right across the whole floor. We're checking each one is level, but not only each beam must be level, they must all be level across the whole room. And now's the time to level these. You can't go and level afterwards on the plywood, you level on your beam. So everyone is in place and level, and when the plywood goes in, the floor will be level. Right, so as you can see the reading in these beams are sitting on 10% in the green on our property meter, we're very happy with that. Uh, and at 12% is what we're looking for and anything below is a gift. Beams are dry, flowers on the way, insulation is going well.
Okay, the job's uh, taking shape. Our second row of plastics in. It's deep looped over the beams. Remember, it's a 250 micron plastic, a virgin plastic. You can't use recycled plastics, it'll disintegrate. You need a 250 micron virgin plastic, it's not expensive. Then after this row of plastic, the next row of plastic we put is a plastic flush over the beams. That plastic will come up the wall behind the skirting so that moisture can't get into the back of the skirting. And uh, that'll be our final plastic. Then we can start putting in our plywood. Right, final sheet of plastics in. Now we're going to put the plywood on. Before we start laying the floor, let's just check the moisture's all right. So I'm just I'm going to check the moisture here. The moisture is sitting here on about 9%. We're looking at 12% on the proteometer, so we're within our limit over here. It's actually more like 8%, which is good. And this is a plywood subfloor, so of course it must be dry. So it's a much better situation than if it was concrete. There we've got more danger. So there we're sitting on about 8%. This is the flooring we're going to lay. And the flooring the camera can see that we're sitting on 6%. So we are 2 percentage points difference, and that's what we're looking for, a maximum of 2 percentage points difference. We're going to then check the moistures also down the outside, in the middle, and around, just to make sure that everything is right. It's no use just checking in one place. What Henry's doing now is just marking on the actual plywood pencil line so that he knows where to screw. This pencil line sits directly over the joist or beam underneath the board because when the whole floor is covered with boards, you're not going to be able to see the joist. So you rather mark it and you know exactly where to put your screws. Right guys, you saw the installer cutting the edge of this board. The reason for that is that it was sticking over the actual beam underneath. And of course, when you put your next one down, it's going to be a weak point. So we make sure that the end of the board sits in the middle, in the middle of a beam. So both ends are sitting on a beam. You'll notice that we've left a little 5 millimeter gap between the boards. This is also for expansion purposes. It's a full big board, at least it's got a little bit of space to move into. If it was tight and did expand, there's a possibility to push itself up. So we always leave a 5 millimeter gap all around on the boards for expansion. <laughs> Guys, you won't believe this is the same room that we started earlier on. We have all the termite, the rotted beams, all the moisture, all the problems we had here. This is now the way a crawl space has got to be handled according to Sulphur, South African Wooden Laminate Flooring Association. Now we have the subfloor, all the plastics are in, and this floor will now be good for the next hundred years at least. Remember the five millimeter gaps around the plier, of course also the same gaps around the edges. The, the subfloor is now screwed in to the beams underneath. Don't forget also we have to check that the subfloor or the screens are perfectly straight. So we're going to put our straight edge on the floor over here. The maximum dip we want under here is three millimeters. Irrespective of if it's a one meter, two meter or three meter straight edge, 
no more than three millimeter dip. dip. If it's more than three, well, then you've got to do your self-leveling, which we showed you in the pre-installation requirements. So, very happy with this floor. And voila, this is it. Now we have a subfloor, you can do whatever you want on it. So, we're going to have a look in the next session, what we're going to actually lay on top of the subfloor. This is the way to do a crawl space. The only other way to do a crawl space is to actually throw a full, compact, 250 micron plastic and then throw a slab. But that can take months to dry. This is the quick way. This little installation took about two or three days. Now we can carry on and do our installation. Now it's time to put the plastic. We have, even though it's a subfloor done in uh, plywood, we still do the same thing we do in all installations. Remember, rule number one, always plastic. 250 micron SABS. After the plastic, we can lay our self adhesive mat and then we start laying the flooring. This particular installation we're doing on the plywood subfloor that from the crawl space that we did in the earlier session. This installation would also be on a concrete screed, cement screeds, it's exactly the same method. So plastic, whether it's plywood or whether it's cement or concrete, plastic goes on now. Okay, as you can see, we've overlapped the plastic by about 300 millimeters. Tape the joint. Guys, as you can see, the plastic we're using here is SABS. This is called SABS Green and it's a 250 micron. There you go, 250. Right, this is the sticky elastic mat that we're going to do with a permanent bond. Just want to show you, just uh, this particular mat has some strands of reinforcement. This is to ensure that the adhesive does not delaminate from the mat. So be sure using a top quality that will not delaminate and will be a permanent bond. Right, now we're going to roll out the sticky mat right through the floor and then we can start laying. So let's go and do that. Right, you can see at this point you're cutting the mat. It's a lot easier to cut the mat than upside down. Then we turn it over to make sure that the sticky side is facing up. Remember, the mat is installed 90 degrees to the floor and not in the same direction as the floor. Okay, what you just see now is uh, Henry here doing the installation using what he calls a starting plastic. This is to save cutting off a piece of the elastic mat 
to create the flap. So he keeps all his old plastics from the other installations and uses it as a starter. So he's actually saving himself some money here. Yeah, they, these are all different lengths. Right, as you can see, this is the start of the floor. It's being laid on the dummy flap. The minute you pull this flap back, it will then make contact with a sticky mat, and then it will be stuck for life. So, first three or four lines are going in while it's on the dummy flap, so they can position everything nicely, and then when it's all positioned, they will pull this flap back. If you don't use a flap, you put it straight onto the mat, of course, you cannot, you cannot position yourself. With the, with the strip flooring, you normally get staggered pieces. This helps to create an uneven stagger in your floor. And uh, when you get to your joints, as you can see over here, you don't want any other piece to be too close. You want at least a 200 millimeter apart, so that will give you the strength. If you put it too close, you'll get a bit of weakness. So 200 millimeter apart at a minimum and fully staggered, no patterns to be created. If you're working with a set length floor and you have a set room, it's exactly one length. If your offcut is your starter and your offcut is your starter, you're starting to create a pattern. This needs to be discussed with the owner if you're going to create that pattern because otherwise you may have a floor that's going to reject it. You need to create a staggered floor. And this you can achieve by playing with your starters and then creating that stagger. As you can see here, there's a small chip here. The installers have spotted this and they've marked it off and this board's now going to come out. If they had spotted it only after they'd pulled this plastic back, then they would have had a major repair. So please inspect your boards during installation before you pull your plastic back. And this board is not a whole waste because you, if you cut it off here, it can be used as a board at the end of the line. So you're only going to waste this a little bit. You can see the installers have put four, four lines in, they're happy everything is straight and now we're going to start pulling back the plastic so the floor will make contact with the sticky mat and then it's stuck. So let's start pulling. Right, 
So the, the dummy flap is now being used and now we're sitting on the original flap of the mat and now installation can continue. Guys, generally with this elastic mat system, there is no glue in the tongue and groove. However, there may be a few reasons why one needs to put glue in the tongue and groove in certain places. And one of the reasons, as you're seeing here now, is the fitter in this doorway laid the passage first by the entrance door and then started with a new mat going into the lounge area. So that means all the joints are in a line. So if you just lay without putting glue on that join, you'll find that you'll get a separation at that point and a big gap. So in this particular case, you need to put glue in the groove to stop that separation happening. Another reason why the, where you may need to put glue is if you start laying in the center of the room in one direction and then continue later in the opposite direction. There's two ways of doing that and one of them would be to start a new mat in one direction and a new mat in the opposite direction with a glue line in the middle to stop any separation. The other would be just to cut away the plastic and leave the mat on both sides and then create dummy flaps on either side so you don't have to put the glue. Both ways would be acceptable. Another reason for not putting glue, guys, is of course, if you need to change a board, it's possible. If you put glue in every single line, then you cannot change a board. And of course, with a solid wooden floor, you know you cannot lay with glue in the tongue and groove at all. Right, what we're pulling out here now is another dummy flap because it's a new mat, a new join on a, on a new line of the mat. So you need to make another dummy flap so you can get onto the flap of the original mat again. So you use the dummy flap again and now we're getting back onto the original mat. Guys, if you have to do this and use a little bit of cold wood glue, white glue, please make sure you clean the floor with a damp cloth while the glue is still wet. If you try and do it when it's dry, you're going to damage the floor. So you have to do this while the glue is still wet. Right, and now we can carry on laying. Here's the rest of the room, all done. This is the lounge. What a difference it is to compare to what it was. And now we're gonna just put some skirtings in and then back with the furniture and the floor's finished. Uh, just a little trick to fit skirtings can be a long laborious job. These 
concrete nailers are quite cheap. I think they're about a thousand rand. Remember, we in 2012, so if you see this video in five years' time, it might be a bit more. But anyway, about a thousand rand for a gun like this. It's a pneumatic concrete nailer. And uh, yeah, it's just a matter of just shooting, shooting, shooting with pneumatics. The old days, they used to use a bullet with gunpowder to shoot these things, but now it's all pneumatics. So I'm going to give this to Henry, and Henry's going to just shoot it in. Right, guys, so all you'll do now is I'll just uh, heat this little nail with a little uh, countersink in, a little bit of uh, wood filler, matching wood filler, and that's your skirting done. Right, guys, the, the floor is just about finished now. We'll take you for a walk around, you'll see the whole floor. But we're here standing in the entrance hall. Uh, you know, with focal points, it's very important to know where you're starting your floor from. So we decided to start the floor from off this wall here, because the front door is right here. So in other words, we start here, we're still straight. When a person walks into the house, the floor is still running straight. If we would have started from the far wall, by the time we got here, the floor may have been running a bit skew, and that would have been odd. So focal points are important, guys. Remember, you must know where and why you're starting your floor, from what wall and why you're starting from that wall. Right, now just to talk a little bit about scripts. This is a wooden floor, it's an engineered floor, but it's real wood. You'll see down here at the bottom, it's, you can see this gap here, not very pretty. So one would use a T-strip to cover that. There's the T-strip. Remember not to glue the strip to the floor, but to glue the strip with a T onto the bottom and some glue on the side, on the concrete side is fine. So that will cover that. Rather use wooden strips for wooden floors. Don't try with aluminium because with aluminium it's a bit of a mismatch. So try and match your wooden strips if it's stair nosings, if it's key strips or end caps. Try and stick with wood. And uh, yeah, and that's our sticky mat installation done. Okay guys, today we're going to look at sports flooring. Sports flooring is a big thing in South Africa today. There's Virgin Active gyms, there's Planet Fitness gyms, a lot of gyms coming up. Every single gym has a sports floor. Of course, there's still squash court flooring, there's basketball flooring, and all, rollerblade, inline rollerblade hockey. All these things use wooden floors today. It's a specialist field, and I'm going to show you today a little bit about sports flooring, how it's installed and why it's different to the normal domestic. First of all, your sports flooring is all equal in one length. It's very important to have one length in a sports floor because you always want the end of your plank to end on the middle of a baton. So in other words, if there's any impacts, it's not going to break the end match. And we'll show you that a little bit closer in a minute. And because of the one length, you can get equal centers. So it always ends in the baton. You don't have to start putting in dummy batons and all that kind of thing. Today we're at Planet Fitness, we're installing the sports floor. You can see, as you'll see just now when the camera shoots around, it's a, quite a big floor, longer than your normal eight meters. Uh, you can get away with this in a gym for the simple reason that you are, have a acclimatized area here. It's fully acclimatized. The humidity, which I've tested, is sitting around about 30, 30 degrees, or 30%, sorry. The humidity is sitting around 30%. And, um, that means this wood will acclimatize exactly to this area and shouldn't expand and contract once all the air conditions are on all the time. So you can go wider. It's also a nail down floor. It's best for sports floors as nail downs on battens. You can also do sports floors on other systems where there's uh, elastic mats or where there's spongy mats. But generally the wooden floors are done with battens, the old fashioned way of nail down. Right, so now we're going to show you a little bit about what's happening on the installation, a little bit of a closer view. So let's go and have a look. Guys, first of all, this is a nail down floor. So they're using a nail that comes from America. You see it's tapered and serrated. And just now you'll see this, uh, the, the nailing machine that's actually putting the floor in. It's very quick. The floor like this can be laid in one day. It's probably about 200 square meters. So it's imperative that you use the right nail to put in a sports floor like this. When it comes to any nail down floor, the correct nail, because if you're using a brand nail on the pneumatic, it's the wrong nail, the floor is going to work itself loose. Right, so the nail is important. Number two, you can see here there's only a sheet of plastic 
under the baton. Generally in a domestic situation, we want a plastic under and over the baton. The reason for that is, when you put in the domestic floor, your battens are anchored through the wood into the concrete, which makes a hole in your plastic. And of course, your second layer of plastic will stop any moisture, anything comes through that little hole. That's just the insurance. On a floor like this, these battens are all loose laid. We'll show you just now how we can move these battens. They're not anchored to the ground. The reason is that every batten has a rubber, so you get an effect of a sprung floor. So that's why the battens are loose laid, because if they were anchored, this effect would disappear. You wouldn't be able to have a sprung motion. Right, so you'll have a look because it's... The idea, you can see here's the, the batten ending in the middle. So of course, if there's any impact and you, someone hits hard into the floor, it's not going to do that and crack the floor. It cannot do that. So there it gives you a, solid, a full solid floor. So these battens are spaced at 436 millimeters, which we're looking for the closest to 400 millimeters. So 436 millimeters, according to this length plank, gives you centers of 436. So your batten is set and your plank will always sit in the middle of a batten, or at least on the batten. You'll also notice, as I said earlier, there's only one sheet of plastic, so we'll just, for what it's worth, I'll just quickly take a quick moisture reading underneath, into the ground. Here we're talking around about 12% on the protimeter, which we're happy with. The wood, the wood is sitting around about 12%, so we have a good equilibrium in this situation. The moisture in the beam here is sitting on 10%, Again, happy. Screen at 12, timber at 12, beams at 10, everything's within 2% of each other. We have a happy situation in this installation. Here you just seen the expansion along the joint here. That expansion is important because this floor is 10 meters wide and if this floor expands, it can close that gap and burst up. Now, the maximum they can leave here is 20 millimeters because of the skirting. Now, if this floor had to expand and burst, this might actually be an installer fault. But the installer feels safe because he knows there's a climate control in the room. It's air conditioned, which brings the humidity and the moisture down. Uh, this fit has been fitting floors in gyms for many, many years and never had a problem because of his air conditioning system. So be careful, if there's no air conditioner, you're going to get humidity, you're going to expand, you're going to have, this floor is going to burst up. The installer feels safe, he's taking the responsibility of this. Because the skirt is only 20 millimeter, he's happy because of his climate control in the room. Okay? As we said, this is a sports floor, and there's a special flooring made for sports flooring. First of all, it's got to be all one length. Normal timber, it's hard to get everything in one length, so the sports floor is normally a made up floor. You can see the joins and the laminations. They can laminate this board to equal one length. So that gives the sports floor now one length so your battens can be set at certain centers. Then of course, if you can have a look at the edge of this, you'll see how thick this part is here. That's your resurface area on a sports floor. Sports floors take more of a pounding than a domestic floor, so you may need to re-sand and reseal more often. That's why you have an extra thick surface on a sports floor. Right, now we're gonna do some nailing so you can see the floor actually going in. Let's go. Right, what you can see happening here is we've got one guy actually placing the timber, that's called racking the floor. Another guy knocking it in to make sure it's all tight. And here comes the last guy with the quarter nail hammer. And he's hitting it and you can see the speed of that nail. Proper nail, countersunk at a, at a speed. This whole room will be finished in one day and it's over 200 square meters. Right, while he's marking and cutting the glass plank, I just want to show you the end sits on the beam never in the middle. Very important on a sports floor. Now this can also go for school halls, stages, or sports flooring where there's huge traffic, commercial wear. You can often do this. So you don't have a problem of the timber caving in under pressure and causing the top of the grooves to break out. So center of the baton, very important on a sports floor. I just wanted to show you the, the baton over here. You can see this baton it's a 50 by 50 planed all around pine batten. Planed all around, that means it's always equal. Sometimes rough sawn timber is not always equal, or planed all around is equal. So the size is the same. It's a piece of timber placed over here with a rubber, a 10 millimeter rubber, which will give you 
some shock absorption against shin splints for the people doing aerobics, that type of thing. Very important, and you can see these battens are loose laid. There's no anchors in this baton whatsoever. That's why it doesn't pierce the plastic, and we're happy with one plastic, and this room is upstairs anyway. If you are worried about anything, please, then you can still use a double plastic. A quick point to show you here, because the battens are loose laid, they need to be one, of course, you're not going to one batten that's 10 meters long, make a join and put some them on each side and nail it through to give it the strength because it's loose laid. As you can see, it's loose. Guys, members of the association, you like all the installer members to have their teams accredited. There's two ways of doing that. Either you can credit on site or you can credit at our venue and uh, go through all the motions so we can pass you as an accredited installer. Uh, difficult to do a sports floor in our situation, so we'd rather come to a site like we've done today. Today, Andrew is being tested here by Sandra, our secretary, and uh, they will be accredited today for the sports floor. That's why the secretary is also here on this installation today.